All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Dunnigan Mott Music and Movie Podcast. I'm Devin Dunnigan, and here with me, as always, is Mr. Stephen Mott. How you doing, brother? Microphone muted. Devin Dunnigan. Um, yes. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Um, no. So, we are here, um, the, the DTM Configurational Podcast. So back to you, Devin. All righty. So today we are back and we are going to be discussing the 1981 album by Eric Clapton, Another Ticket. So this is his seventh studio album, his or seventh studio solo album produced by Tom Dowd, which this was his first since I believe No Reason to Cry that he did with Clapton. Because the last couple and then the very beginning of this record was actually produced by Glenn Johns. It was released February 17th, 1981, according to Wikipedia. But I saw on the Where's Eric website that there's no actual known release date. So, I mean, I'm not real sure there. This album was the last album that Clapton did for RSO Records before it eventually folded in 1983 this album went gold in the united states and was relatively successful album i believe it went number seven in the charts and it ended in the i think like 72 the year end chart so i mean it did relatively decent and this album was also made amidst the very very huge battle of alcoholism with eric clapton and he would later seek rehabilitation after the tour for this album, which, from what I've heard, was pretty, pretty bad. It was pretty disastrous. So, yeah, I mean, this was Stephen's pick to kind of bring us into the new year with the, with the podcast and all. And so some of the backstory that is pretty known among Clapton fans, this was originally an album called Turn Up Down, and it was produced by Glenn Johns. And it was ultimately rejected by the record company, which I believe this was the first record to ever be rejected for Clapton. And the bootleg versions do exist. There's a couple of different versions. I know the version that we listened to to prepare for this episode is a slightly more scaled down edited version, but there's a longer version that's out there as well. And the version that we're going to actually talk about, because we're going to do, we're going to talk about it during this actual album review for another ticket, but we're also going to do kind of a mini review of the Turn Up Down album itself and put that out as kind of a midweek episode or whatever you want to call that, what we've been doing with our album ranking episodes and stuff like that, doing two kind of themed episodes. But yeah, there the track listing for the Turn Up Down album is There Ain't No Money, Games Up, Rita May, Freedom, Evangelina with Albert Lee on vocals, Home Lovin' with Gary Brooker on vocals, Hold Me Lord, Something Special, I'd Love to Say I Love You, Catch Me If You Can, and then there's a couple of other ones. One there's called Thunder and Lightning, and then there's another one that Stephen had actually just sent me before the podcast that I cannot remember the name of at the moment. And... There's also this small blues instrumental at the very beginning. So I first kind of discovered this album. I had always known the, or always knew the big single off the record, which we'll get into as we go through the track listing. And I kind of just, on a whim one day, listened to this record and really, really enjoyed it. I had not really gotten into listening to a lot of Clapton's material full length so this was probably one of the first albums i heard all the way through and i really enjoyed it i'll talk about how this album has aged for me at least as we go throughout the review but i will go ahead and say right now this is an album that i do somewhat like and it's not a perfect album it's not one of clap his best albums but i do enjoy it and it is definitely in my opinion a sign of what was to come with Clapton's solo career. So yeah, that's all I pretty much have is kind of an opening 
kind of thought for the re thoughts for the record, whatever you want to say, opening or whatever the crap. You know, everybody that's listened to the podcast knows by now how we are. But Stephen, what what's your kind of opening statement on the record? That's what I meant to say. Opening statement. And how did you discover this record? Uh, all right, so <clears throat> my mic was unmuting. So my opening statement of this record is really because this band um you know i mean like when they when they sacked the band for money and cigarettes he should have done this for this record previously because um i don't know man i i just i just don't know like it, it seems like not only were the song idea is not that great to begin with. Okay, it's like the band was like not really into what they were doing. They didn't give a crap. It's like they were just there and they were just there to collect a paycheck and then go back to smoking their cigar or smoking whatever they smoked. Um, I mean, it just seems like one of those type things like I remember reading about Bob Dylan, reading one of his books one day, and he talked about how the band would literally sit in the studio and play cards while he wrote songs, and then they would just, and then the band would come in there and play the song after like one or two takes, and then that was it, and then he'd go back and write another song, and they'd go back to drinking and partying and playing cards again, I mean, and it seems like that's what this situation was probably like. Um, I know, I know it sounds kind of far out to just say, oh, I think it was like this or that, but it just seems like the band was not into it is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, <laughs> you know, I just, there's no energy to it. That's all I can say. During this period, Clapton was kind of in a slump and I feel like people were, people around him were pressuring him to release something and, um, turn up down you know, was the first something, and then the next something was this, I guess, which wasn't that much better. So we'll get into it later, but that's just my initial my initial thoughts. Um, very thought-provoking opinions I have on this record. Um, and I'm Pete, so bye. All right, and yeah, I just want to piggyback off of you with the, the whole band thing because that is important to mention here. So Clapton had previously gotten rid of much of his band during the 78 tour for Backless, and then that's when Albert Lee came into the fold, and then when he toured the next year in 79 and went to Japan and all of that, that's when Dave Marquis came in on bass, and then Henry Smanetti on drums, Chris Stanton on keyboard, and Chris Stanton ended up being a long-standing keyboard player for him way after the fact. I mean, even up until here recently, and maybe still not, to this day, I'm not real, real sure. But yeah, the lineup overall is, so you've got Clapton, of course, on guitar and vocals, Albert Lee, guitar and backing vocals. You've got Gary Brooker on organ, keyboard, vocals, or backing vocals. And originally, Albert Lee and Gary Brooker had a little bit more to do with this album. But then it seemed like once Tom Dow got involved, it seemed like their influence got knocked down a little bit. And it kind of became like they were essentially Clapton's backing band. While originally, Clapton may have wanted them to have a little bit more to do with the album. They actually wanted them to be a contributing factor to the album. But... You have Dave Marquis on bass guitar replacing Carl Radle, and then Henry Spinetti on drums replacing Jamie Oldacre. And Henry Spinetti actually came back to the band very briefly in like the early 2010s, because that, I think it's the Beloise session or Baloise session, whatever it is. It's on YouTube. It was a, actually a pretty good show, and he's on drums there, and I think he may have toured with him briefly during that time. And then you have Chris Stanton on keyboards, as I'd already said. And, I mean, that kind of makes the band up right there. And a solid band, but like Steven said, just not a whole lot of fire. Like, it just kind of, they really seem like a backing band. And 
that's it. There's no real fire with them. And I know Clapton had kind of gotten into a rut in the late 70s about he had played with the same band since the early 70s, so he wanted to change up. And I completely understand that. But at the same time, it's almost like they're just robots. Like Dave Marquis' bass really doesn't stick out on this record, except for, I, would, I will say, one song. Henry Spinetti's drumming, I think he's a solid drummer but very, very simplistic. And he kind of strikes me more like Steve Gadd, like very robotic in a sense. And I mean, no disrespect to the guy. He is a very serviceable drummer. And I mean, there's, there has to be a good reason he ha has a career. I mean, he probably was very reliable and people knew if they got him in to play drums, he would play, the, he'd do the job, be done with it. So, I mean, there that's probably the reason he's had a career overall and it's interesting to note that both Gary Brooker and Henry Spinetti did come back to Clapton's band in the, the later 80s with August for It's In The Way That You Use It which was on the Color of Money soundtrack so you get a little bit of a reunion of this lineup somewhat during that time period so yeah um, that's pretty much all I have to really say I'm glad you reminded about the band situation though because I've totally totally forgot about that because this is the first studio album and the only studio album with this actual lineup on it because they were sacked prior to the final Money and Cigarettes album even though the majority of the lineup still there it is um, it is strikingly strikingly different so yeah that's it so we can get into the track listing now get the first track on here something special so this is essentially a slower blues type song, has a tinge of like kind of soul music in there. And I, I like the song. It's really, no pun intended, it's really nothing special to me, but I, I think it's a good opener. It's, it's a decent song and some good guitar work all across the track. And this was also one of the few songs that made this record from the Turn Up Down album, albeit a slightly faster tempo, and I will go ahead and say that now. Like all the songs that made this album from the Turn Up Down record were much faster than the Turn Up Down album. And some good harmonies from what from when I listened to it, it kind of appeared to be more or less Albert Lee. Now it could have been some hint, some get some Gary Brooker in there. But I heard more Albert Lee in the mix, a good solo for this particular track, and you can definitely tell that Tom Dow produced this record because it has his production style written all over it. So yeah, that's something special to me. It's, like I said, kind of nothing special, but still a good song. So Stephen, take something special. Well, it definitely um, does not qualify for social security um so thank you next i'm just playing um not great so that's all i put in my notes um very underwhelming start to the record um i feel like they should have put one of these better ones like maybe i can't stand it at the first part of the album because that's probably the, by far the best song on the record <laughs> um and that's not an, that's not an exaggeration i mean black rose is pretty good but other than that <clears throat> i mean just not to give it away here but um it's kind of downhill from there um i just don't know and i just don't know so i mean joe biden so uh, yeah so, yeah, so Black Rose, I mean, it's a pretty good song. So, I mean, something special is just this thing where I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just don't think it's that great because it's, it's, it's chate. And, and, uh, yeah, so I'm trailing off. So, number one track on the album, um, I'm going to rate this song. A point five out of two. So, 
by. So the next track on here is Black Rose. So not to be confused with the Thin Lizzy album, Black Rose, but and I think there's a movie called Black Rose, like it's a, like a early 80s horror movie or something. Heck, let me go look this up, because I believe that's the case, actually. I've heard of it. A Black Rose is one. I know it is it's a Thin Lizzy's at least album, maybe a song. I'm not real, real sure. Uh, an 1988 horror film, so yeah, it, it was. I thought it was from that period of time. But yeah, the best track on the album for me reminds me a lot of Almond Brothers. Like this could have been kind of a mid '70s Almond Brothers type track, like Blue Sky or Melissa or something like that. That's kind of what it reminds me of, like mostly Blue Sky, but kind of the acoustic stuff reminds me a lot of Melissa. And then I love the harmonies from Gary Brooker on this, tra on this particular track. Some great slide work all across. And this was written by Troy Seals, who did, he wrote a lot of country material and played on a lot of country stuff as well. And this could have made a good single, in my opinion. This, I think the one they ended up picking, which Stevens done talked about it, I can't stand it. I think that this could have probably been a really good second single, possibly. So, yeah, that, that's all I really got to say about this track, this particular track. I keep trying to go directly to track, but this particular track. So, Stephen, take Black Rose. Um, yeah, so particulational factors um diesel particulate filter so the thing is is black rose um is it has this particulation to it and um it's, it's very particular of my particularities um so yeah so black rose is just the, probably the second best on the record to me and i'll I don't know. I would probably put it toward the middle of the record because you need to have some redeemable qualities throughout. And I would probably shuffle the track listing for sure. Um, but I, I really, I mean, you mentioned the production. The production to me added some to this record. Like, for example, the title track, another ticket, not to jump ahead, but I am um, because I don't care. So. <laughs> Um, another ticket. So basically, it has this thing where the production saves it very much. Um, and that's the whole thing with this record to me. It's the production brings this from a one out of one out of ten to, to like maybe a four. So um, I don't know how I would describe it. It's just like kind of atmospheric, I would say. That's the only way I can think to describe it. Um, you know, but other than that, I think I saw somewhere where, um, Turn Up Down was like, or we well, saw somewhere, I, I, I didn't see it, I heard it, like, <laughs> that was dumb, like, okay, so I was listening to Turn Up Down, and I just kind of think it, it was a little bit better than this record and the way that it, the, the band was just, was, it seemed like the band was a little more into it than this. I think Turn Up Down was better than this. So I want to say it was recorded in something like Surreal or however you say it, or I'm, I'm not real sure, but it seems like that's what it said on there. <laughs> but it seemed like they were more into it then. And for this, that it seems like they were, they were just really, really not. They were just trying to throw something together. I mean, that's just what it seems like to me. Because as this record goes on, it puts me to sleep. Like that's literally what it, all it does. I said, like I was, you know, saying before we recorded to Devin, like it seems like I have to be in a certain mood to really sit there and be like, oh, I can kind of vibe with this album because I would quickly turn it off if I was in a mood where I was, you know, like, you know, d during the middle of the day or something like that where I'm already woke up or I'm already kind of halfway energetic. 
I'd be like, this is just boring to me. <laughs> but I don't know. It just kind of falls flat. That's the way I would describe it. So, um, yeah. So, bye. All righty. So, the next track on here, Blow Wind Blow. So, this is the stereotypical blues song of the record. So, Clapton does one of these on pretty much every album he has ever done. Except for, for August. I guess you'd say because well maybe behind well behind the sun had the same old blues so not the only one was August but even Journeyman Pilgrim and I mean I know all the rest of them had like blues songs all over it so from from the yeah. from the cradle didn't have any blues stuff on it oh no because that was all blues <laughs> no it, it, so, it didn't have any oh yes. So this is a cover of the Muddy Waters song, or Muddy Water song, whatever it is. <laughs> Some people say that word differently than others. And it's a great one. I think this is a great cover. I think there's some great guitar work, a great guitar solo during the, during the track. Definitely a showcase for Clapton playing some, blues, some great blues guitar. This was a song that stayed in the set for a few tours in the 80s, and I believe they brought it back during the Nothing But The Blues slash From The Cradle tour in 94, 95. Some great piano work on the song. Chris Stanton is a badass piano player. He has always been a standout in Clapton's band, and uh, he's just such a great musician. And this was the one song, I talked about it earlier, where Dave Marquis' bass doesn't really stand out. It does here because he he plays this. I'm, it sounds to me like a stand up bass, so it, it kind of it sticks out a lot more than any of the other songs for sure. And that, that's no like I said earlier, no pun intended. But so Stephen, take blow wind blow. So this is what I would say about this. So I turned it up, and then I turned it back down very quickly. So that's why they named the record "Turn Up Down." So. <laughs> uh, yeah basically I cut it off very quickly so because it sucked so yeah um, yeah so blow wind blow I just don't think that Clapton you know I, I don't know if he realizes that when he does his covers it comes off it's just this stupid complete putrid shit is what it is blow wind blow track number three all freaking ready man we've got this stuff where like Devin mentioned he's got to do some blues stuff okay i get it so you know it's what, what he likes to do is his roots or whatever he likes to do the blues i mean honestly i don't i don't like this one at all I mean, I, I kind of like Floating Bridge better because this one is just boring and just, I mean, I will say the only, this is one that maybe the band was a little bit more involved in musically and maybe tried a little bit on, but I mean, I think honestly it would have benefited if Albert Lee <clears throat> would have been a lot more involved with more, more guitar playing that we can hear in the mix um, because in Turn Up Down the, the band members had their own songs and stuff like I think Gary Brooker had a song that he did on it and <clears throat> then you had Albert Lee who did, who did a song and, um, and Va at Evangelina and honestly like that was a really, really good take because it, he played really good guitar on it. Uh, and Albert Lee, you know, aside from the stuff he does with Clapton, he is a complete virtuoso. But when he, when he plays with Clapton, he tones that, he kind of rolls that back a lot, <laughs> you know. But unfortunately, but my uh, another point I was going to get to with this record before I forget it is like our we turn up turn up down is that you know like with that record it almost seemed like a a band 
I know, I know that sounds stupid, but just bear with me. So, <clears throat> like, it seems like it would have been, you know, like, remember when Clapton was, like, Derek and the Dominoes, you know, when he was Cream, when he was this and that. It seemed like, you know, if you think about a Cream record, for example, it had a Jack Bruce song that he sung or two, or maybe a little more. And it even had a Ginger Baker song. So, you know, it, at one point that he wrote, you know, um, but my point is, is like the Turn Up Down record kind of had that at that band feel, not so much a, a Clapton solo record feel. And I think that benefited him a lot because he was out of it during this period. And yes, he was writing songs, but it felt like he was just forcing himself to write songs and they weren't, you know, they, they, they didn't have much meaning behind them. And I just, you know, you could tell when somebody writes a song and they really put something into it and something's behind the song versus when you just jot something down and you just kind of throw it together in 10 minutes. And that's what it felt like with his record. He was out of it. He didn't care. People around him were forcing him to do this record. This is my opinion. I don't know this for a fact, but I have read his book a couple times through, and I can tell you that I'm not that far off factual-wise from his autobiography. <laughs> um, he was, you know, there was this was still during his era where he wasn't quite, um, you know, out from under the alcoholism and stuff. So, and as Devin mentioned, I think around this time was when he when he went on stage and like fell over a plant or something like that, and he had to cancel a tour or whatever and got uh, ulcers. So, um, you, I mean, and obviously from drinking. So, you know, but that's just kind of a thing I wanted to make or a point I wanted to hit before I forgot is that for I mean, for take it for what you will, but you know. This record, another ticket, I feel like he, it would have benefited from a much more of a collective involvement than what it was from the other band members. Seeing as the other band members could, you know, have their own bands, have their own solo records. Bye. Oh, my. So, <clears throat> so next track on here is Another Ticket. So this is the, I said the last track, the stereotypical blues song. Another thing Clapton likes to do on every album is a damn ballad. So this is the stereotypical ballad off the record. An early glimpse into the direction he would take on, like, Behind the Sun in August. I like this, this track. I like it. It's not anything special to me, but I, I mean, no one can hear me once again. It's not something special to me, but... I do like it. I think it's it's pretty good. And I like the structure of the track, in particular, like after after he says another ticket, when he goes into that kind of slow, almost like a waltz kind of, of vibe or beat, whatever you want to call it, a rhythm, rhythm. That's the word I'm looking for, rhythm. Every time I do a podcast like this, I blank on words to say. But when he gets in kind of this like slower vibe go or slower rhythm going. I like that a lot. I think that's a very, very good, a very, very good part of the song, a very good kind of light and shade type feel. And his singing, that's the one big gripe I have about this song. I, like I said, I do like the song, but it, it's his singing is like very all over the place. It's like he's almost trying to overdo it or compete with Gary Brooker or whatever. And the instrumentation needs to be a lot more subtle, like to match the more pretty, that's the best way I can think of describing, like the pretty sound to it, the just the more slow, sort of lighter tone to this particular track. I think that like, in particular, like the drums are like way in the mix on this song. Like Henry Spaghetti is all over the place. And like some of the harmonies where they should have been kind of more up to the front in the mix, like almost like they're mixed to the back and the drums and the instrumentation and all is mixed way up. And the harmonies, I think, are great all across this record. I think Gary Brooker, Albert Lee and Clapton made a really, really good three part harmony team. In particular, like Clapton and 
Judy Brooker are great together. Like their voice, they, they they just go together really, really great. Take another ticket to title track. I mean, title track. I mean, I I mean I like the way that they have this in the middle of the record. Um, I, I do like the placement of it, but the thing is. I agree with you with the production thing. I mean, I like the production, um, but it does seem like thinking about it that the drums are a little bit high. <laughs> yeah, the mix. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, this thing is pretty good, but the thing is, is like, I don't know how to describe it. It's just not. This, this whole record doesn't have much meaning or kind of purpose behind it. No soul behind it. It's just like Clapton. Um, I just kind of want to say that he just kind of probably still resented the universe at this point for whatever reason. <laughs> um, his alcoholism being one and obviously, you know, for why he was an alcoholic, um, for you know the many reasons that is, I guess. So, um, but um, you know, I don't. I just, I just think that this, this just kind of, this record is just dead and out. Like it just falls flat. That this, you know, the people around him. Like I told Devin earlier. Like I just don't. I, I just can't believe that they actually. The record company actually even didn't reject this record too, because there's no, it's just something majorly missing from the energy to this record. Like you'd have to be a Clapton nut, I feel like, to sit there and to sit through this record, because most people would be like, okay, I'm starting to kind of get bored of this like there's no redeemable quality as far as you know throw you know throw cold gin in there in the set just throw something in there different and fast so um you know they, they could have gotten ace fraley in there and done another version of dreams and and done it with motley crew that's four versions of dreams so I mean, today's January 14th, but people, it sure feels like April 14th. So back to you, Devin. All righty, and yeah, that's a reference only me and you know. So <laughs> the next track on here is I Can't Stand It. So this was the first single off the record. I thought this was actually the only single, but when I was looking on Wikipedia, it said another ticket was the second single released, I think, like May of 81, so after this record came out. And I think this is a perfect song. This kind of gives a idea of where Clapton would go later on. It's never been performed live, which I found to be very odd. Since this was the big single off the record, I, I figured surely they would have played it at least maybe once, but I can kind of see with like the way the song is. It probably wouldn't have went over that well. It probably may have been a little bit difficult to get in the set, actually, and, and actually get it to where it sounded halfway decent. And this kind of reminds me of the like Michael McDonald era, Doobie Brothers, like Minute by Minute, that album. Kind of reminds me of that sort of stuff. I like the start and stop stuff at the end of it. I, I, like, I like all that. I think that's kind of cool. And so this is one song that I think Henry Spinetti really, really does great on. And there's another album on here I'll talk about, or another song on this album that I'll talk about with Henry Spinetti later on. But yeah, I, I like this song a lot. And this is probably the most well-known track off the record. It's on all the greatest hits albums. It's on, I think it was on Time Pieces. I know it's on Complete Clapton. And I'm trying to think of what the other I've got a, several compil of uh, the cream of Clapton that's on there. I've got a lot of compilations of Clapton. So Stephen, take I can't stand it. 
So this is by far the pretty much best song on the record. By a long shit. Yeah. Like a long shot. Long shit song. So, um, I mean, so this is the thing, man. Like, honestly, number five, and we're already to the best part of the album, and it, it never goes back. It's the thing. They should have spread it out, the, the good songs, a lot more. That's my main gripe with this record, that they should have took maybe, mm, let's just say I can't stand it, put it number one. Take Black Rose, put it about number five. Put another ticket closer to the end, maybe about number eight. Um, so, I mean, basically, you got Rita May as the last track, which just... It's that's stupid to me. Like you listen to this whole record, and then you got one good song at the end, like good one good fast song, and you wait to the end. Nobody is going to listen to the record that long. You know, Rita May should should have been toward the front of the record because you listen to Rita May and you go, okay, you know, this has got a little pep to it. You know, I might could listen to this. Well, then you realize, you know, well, I shouldn't have, you know, listened to it, but. That's besides the point. Um, but the thing is, man, like, I can't stand it. Literally. I mean, that's how I feel about this record. That's that's actually what they should have titled this record. Um, and that's actually what, what I want to title, you know, this episode for me. That, that's my overall thoughts on this record. Bye. Alrighty, so the next track on here is Hold Me Lord. So this is the opener of Side 2, another really, really good song. I love the southern gospel slash kind of bluegrass feel to it. Some good dobo, dobro work on this particular track. Another song from the Turn Up Down sessions, and it has a much more up-tempo flavor to it, if that's what you want to call it. And I like the lyrics a lot. I it, I thought this was actually a cover, like a like a traditional type gospel song or something. But this is actually a composition written entirely like by Clapton, which surprises me. And it seems like it's kind of autobiographical from where he was at at the time, like kind of like praying to God that he'll help them out of the drugs and alcohol and stuff. And I mean. I like that that sentiment to it. I mean, hold me, Lord, hold me, Lord, hold me tight. I'm slipping through or whatever. I, I like I like that sentiment. I mean, I'm very. I mean, I know we're both very very religious and Christians and all. So, I mean, I, I like the sentiment to it. I mean, at least that's what I get out of the song. It's like he's praying to God to get him through all of this and get him deliver him out of alcoholism and stuff like that and drug abuse. So, yeah, that's all I really got for this track. I like this track a lot. So, Stephen, what do you think of Hold Me, Lord? You know, the thing with Clapton is, is like, he has these, he has these songs like that on each album where, not every album, but a lot of them to where they're kind of similar like that. So, yeah, number six, Hold Me, Lord. Um, you know, this record is, is just got to the point to me where I, I couldn't sit through it anymore. It's like, it's like a bad apple. Bye. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. The next... <clears throat> The next track is Floating Bridge. So this is another blues cover, a cover of the Sleepy John Estes song. It's got some good blues guitar, very reminiscent of the early 70s Clapton material, like 461 Ocean Boulevard. That pops to mind very, very immediately when I, when I heard this song. This track is way too freaking long. It's over six minutes long. And yeah, I'm out of 
out of my, I'm out of things to say at this point. It's that freaking bad. It's nothing but a showcase for Clapton's guitar work, and it's just filler. Like I couldn't have put something else off of Turn Up Down on here. Like there ain't no money or freedom or, I mean, even Ange- Evangelina to give at least one of the other members a little bit of a spotlight. I mean, I just when Clapton gets into doing these things, like it kind of makes more sense live than it does on a studio record. Like just jamming out song like this and that's all this this particular song is really is just clapped and jamming the entire time going back and forth playing the, the guitar solo and all and yeah i'm just not, i'm not a big fan of this particular song so steven what do you think of floating bridge so man i i, I tell you like see, when you when you throw these covers in I mean, this this is the kind of stuff that Clapton is is pretty much known for. I mean, it it, it leaves you sit, just sitting there like, okay, so we know we know you, you play blues. You know, we we get the point. When an artist first starts out their career and and they want to, you know, they they want to pretty much. Tell you you're their audience. Okay, at the end of my records, I've already put the hits out there. I'm going to throw stuff to let you know if you come to see me live, this is what you're going to see. You know, I do this too. So Clapton does blues. You know, artists do different things sometimes. They throw in stuff that they were first influenced by. You know, like, for example, Origins Volume 1 by Ace Frehley. So you knew I was going to throw that in there somehow, Devin. Um, so I just couldn't help it. I couldn't stand it. I can't stand it. So Floating Bridge. You know, the thing is, we already know that Clapton, yes, we know what you're going to get when you go to, to a concert. There's going to be jams. You know, there's, there's going to be, that's what he's known for. That's what people come to see him for in concert. So when you know he has to do these, you know, release these records every so often, so to keep to keep relevant, and you know, so the the record company can you know make money, obviously, because that's what they do is they release records. So you know, um, if he's going to stay afloat, you know, this is still there in kind of the middle part of his career, because his career, and you could still you could say his career is still going. I mean, so he was. I guess during this time he was having a midlife crisis of sorts. You could say, and that's kind of an understatement. But <clears throat> so I mean, Floating Bridge. I actually kind of like this, but you know, on a record, I feel like if they would have, I feel like it would have benefited this record if they threw some some live stuff in at the end because Clapton was still good live during this time period. You know. Live always makes him come alive a lot better, like a live kiss, you know? I mean, it's just true. Like, you know, when, when bands play live, solo artists, anything, they, they, they're going to they're gonna put more effort into it. The band's going to be more into it because they got a crowd to play for. So, bye. The next track on here is... Catch Me If You Can. So this was another song from the Turn Up Down album. Once again, much more sped up. I believe it started with a little bit of like a kind of a bluesy lick before it. And you see the this and the next song. The next song's on there too. One of these starts with kind of a bluesy sort of riff. So it does have one of the cooler moments off the record. It has this kind of like like a layer of guitar solos and i'm not sure if it's clapton and albert lee dueling or what it is or if it's just clapton layered over clapton but it's one of the cooler moments of the album i wish there was more of that all righty so the next track and the last track on the record is rita mays so another song from the turn up down album which i mentioned just a minute ago on the last song this was originally in a much slower tempo, so once again, sped up. 
considerably was performed live and it's on the arm show the, the tribute or not tribute but uh i think it was like a benefit show or whatever they did in, a, in the early 80s 83 but he did this song there pretty cool live version now, this song's kind of a mess to me i, I get what it was going for it's, it's an interesting way to end the record kind of fast upbeat Oh, I just think the song's kind of a mess overall. So uh, it kind of reminds me of like Get Ready or Roll It off. Of, hey, it's kind of sleazy vibe to it. And I know those two songs are much slower. But yeah, this, this one kind of reminds me kind of tone, tonally wise. That's what, or whatever you want to say. Tone wise, that's what this reminds me of. This song. So. Some good guitar work on this particular track and some some very all over the place drumming by Henry Spinetti. He's not bad. He's, he's some pretty good drumming, but kind of all over the place and kind of overplays. Yeah, that that's pretty much it. That's the gist of it all. My conclusion for this album, it's interesting to hear how Tom Dowd came in and really shaped everything into a more coherent album. And it kind of seems to be a little bit more thought out to me. So I do prefer this over Turn Up Down. And it does have a noticeably less influence from Gary Brooker and Albert Lee. And it's much more of a spotlight. That's, that's what it kind of seems like is that Tom Dow just said, OK, Clapton is the guy that's selling albums. We're not going to include you two, you two guys, even though you can sing and play your instruments really well. It's a Clapton album. Clapton, you're going to sing everything. This is your album. And it definitely feels like Tom Dow kind of just told those guys to be like, hey, you're a backing band. You're not members of Eric Clapton. Like Clap Eric Clapton is not a band. You're just a backing band to Clapton. And not that I entirely agree with it or, or anything like that. And it does feel more, it's much more of a different kind of record where Turn Up Down feels more to me like a logical progression from like Slow Hand and Backless, just with different musicians. And we talked about a little bit earlier when I was talking about the band. It just seems like they were just held back. And they're very, very simplistic, especially the drumming. It just seems like they were paid to do a gig and they did it. And I would really just, I would love for them to just cut loose and play. That's what it just sounds like. You're just being held back. It, it definitely feels like they were told what to play and when to play. And I, I would rather hear those guys cut loose and, and do something with their sound. All righty. So now we move into our weekly picks for the podcast. So. I'm going to go with Ozzy Osbourne's 1981 album, his second studio album, solo album, whatever you want to call it, Diary of a Madman. So I'm talking about the original mix, not the crappy re-recorded mix, which is an interesting lesson, but still it's, it's kind of a backhanded thing to the guys who originally recorded the bass and drum parts. And I'm glad they reinstated the original bass and drum parts on these last remasters and re-releases and then i just went with an oddball pick i just went through my letterbox and just scrolled to a movie and i'm gonna just go with this one it's probably way out there saw this once i liked it for what it was i like the dc animated movies and so picked all-star superman i thought that one was okay so all righty so that is the episode Hope you all enjoyed this one. Like, comment, subscribe, give us some feedback, and we hope to get back into making episodes on a more regular basis in the days to come. So thank you all for watching or listening, whatever you whatever you do, and God bless you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay free, stay frosty, and we will see you next time.